thank you. Um, so I don't know about a lot of experience, but I'll have to deal with it. Um, look, I guess you've seen this table before. This is the motivation of why we need to do the drug meeting. Um, despite common opinion, I don't think we want another job. We don't really like burning stuff that much, but we've got it because, you know, um, basically, you might know the song, the drums don't work anymore. Well, the drums don't work anymore for us. Okay, so our post merger herbicides don't work, um, and even our pre merchants are under stress as well, I suppose, or, or pressure. So, Windrow Burning is just one of the suite of, um, of tools that have been coined the hard suite seat management tool. There's a few pictures of them. Um, you've got Windrow Burning here, uh, the char cups, which catch the char and drop it in the dump, which we'll do it later. I should have mentioned this is capturing the trash fraction out of the back of the header and then it's incinerated in the autumn. Um, this is just the, the charge fraction uh, drops in the dump and you incinerate that at a later date. Well, this is the Harrington suit destructor, which just works on the mechanical um, you know, destruction of the seeds that come through the header. Um, there are a couple of other systems, the Glenbarth or Red Bale system, well you replace this with a bale and it just bales the whole trash residue which has got the weeds in it, or more recently the char lining which uh, again catches the char fraction um, and drops it uh, in a distinct area, generally in the wheel tracks, just leaves it there to rot or um, will basically have to feed itself. In terms of these three, which are the main ones, they're all basically similarly effective as each other. Okay, 90 plus percent control when you get it right, um, and they're all fairly similar, but there are differences between them. So what, what is this harvest weed seed control? Um, this is just some agronomy 101. You basically start with uh, weeds in a crop, you spray the weeds, you kill those susceptible weeds, but you've always got some survivors there, like germinators, resistant ones, ones that hide under, the, under a rock, and they survive and set seed and go back to the seed bank. Can I just ask people, who thinks spraying herbicides allow herbicide resistance to develop? Put your hand up. Come on. It does, doesn't it? Okay. I don't think it does. What allows herbicide resistance to develop? We select the resistance, right? What we do by allowing them to seed out, return the seed bank, and multiply out, that's what's causing resistance to develop. Okay, so there's some, some importance of that in terms of if you haven't got resistance yet, okay, you can use this tool if you've got resistance, but if you haven't got it yet, there's opportunity to save those products and keep them working in the future. But all other sweet seed management does, it doesn't replace any of this agronomy up here. We're still going to do pre mergers we're still going to do post mergers we're still going to work with crop establishment, populations, road space, and all of that. All we're doing here is stopping whatever survivors come through, going back that seed bank and rotating around. So why the harvest weed seed management? This is from Peter Newman out of Western Australia. Back in the early noughties, he, he chose, I think, 20 paddocks to monitor the uh, ryegrass populations. This maps out those ryegrass populations, uh, and there's another year ago on there, 214. But there's two broad groups. One's that just use herbicides, this top line. One that used um, other sweet seed management plus herbicides. They came from a blowout situation up here somewhere to the left. Herbicides, diligent use of herbicides, that's got that down quite low. But you can see they're still bounced around five plants per square metre. And if you wanted to, you know, half empty sort of way, you could run a line through there and say that they're starting to get away. Okay, herbicides work. We couple it with harvest weed seed management. They've seen that great decline through there. But then when they've used mostly mid-road green, but also chaff cuts, these leaf fruit, um, they've got that down to maybe naught one plant per square metre and bump bubbling along there quite happily. Okay, so it does work for most of Australia on my road. This is just a bit of a table, won't spend too much time on it. We'll talk about a few of those options. This just goes through some of the choices that you might have to make in terms of how effective they are. Certainly those three there, similarly effective. This chart there for windrow rotting, questionable. Um, this upfront cost, so a quarter of a million dollars down to $200 with windrow burning. Um, there's some uh, ongoing R&M costs, um, but impacts in terms of nutrient, um, right down to windrow burning where there's no R&M costs, but there could be higher nutrient impacts going forward. 
effect on ground cover, and of course there's also a change in light actually having to go out and do, do another job. Okay? Suffice to say that this windrow burning with its low entry cost um, and similarly effective is a really good starting point and for a lot of growers um, it's, it's certainly the job and certainly for me with my starlight because I can't put any like this. Um, so it, it sort of suits there. So what is narrow windrow burning? It's pretty simple. You're basically fitting a shoot at the back of the header that captures the entire trash fraction. So no straw choppers or spreaders or anything, you take them off, put them out of the way, you fit a shoot to the back of the header which captures that whole shaft fraction and uh, straw fraction. As you go through and harvest it, you've got to harvest low, I'll bang on about that today. But the theory is, is if you harvest low, any of those weed seeds that are retained on the rye grass or wild radish, germ weed, black oats that are there, you can only go one or two places. If it goes in the tank and you sell to, to Gavin from Grain Corp, he pays you for it, or it ends up in this road here, okay? The road's in there over the summer, and you come back to the autumn, and you just simply burn those roads out. And it's that fire that incinerates those weed seeds, and that's that cutting, you know, stopping that cycle that I was talking about. Stopping those plants returning to the seed bank and multiplying those successive years. Sounds pretty simple. Um, so I suppose just a couple of tips from windrow burning. Um, the first one is to pick your paddock and pick your crop. Okay. Is, now I'll put a little bit of a, uh, um, a hierarchy there of what, what crops you might choose to do first and I'll, have to, I'll tell you why. But certainly chickpeas, um, to a lesser extent lupins, canola, low yielding cereals um, are probably the, the preferred options certainly to get going in. A big part of that is, is that these have low trash, okay, particularly low, uh, kick peas, they're, they're a low trash thing, so you're not going to affect your ground cover negatively or that bad anyway. You're not going to affect harvest efficiency anyway because you're not bringing in that much extra trash. The other thing is because they leave little trash outside of the road, the fire, the chance of the fire goes away and burning the whole paddock are a lot less. Okay, but then you can certainly look at high yielding wheat and need to move into barley. Barley's always it's a bit of a suggested as a bit of a taboo not to go there because the chance of fire escaping that is um, is not great. But um, I certainly think that it's possible. That's um, not exciting, but that's a proper pine mark at home. Um, not last year, the year before, and um, that was four and a half ton there, and you know it's snuck away in a number of places there, but for the most part that paddock is fully intact. So it can be done, and I think really we probably have some distinct advantages in the central and northern region with some rainfall to actually burn bigger crops than what they do in the west where their autumns are terribly dry. But it can be done, so don't discount this um, saying that, oh, we, our crops are too big, we can't do windrow. That's rubbish. Um, you'll fall off quite a few times before you get used to it, um, but it can be done. Um, half my barley last year, I toasted the whole paddock, they were half to do quite well. So, so, what about the weed types and the burden? Well, half the weed seed management work on the retention of that seed, okay, at harvest. So, the weeds must be set above cutter bar height. You've got to harvest low. Um, a lot of people talk about the international standard of beer can height. You want to harvest low to make sure you capture those weed seeds in the front of the header. Um, cutting high but not only misses the weed seeds, but also leaves a lot more trash outside the windrow and increases the chance of fire getting away. And I guess the other thing is that the, the seeds must be retained until harvest, so non shedding So things like bar grass that mature early, shed early, brown grass, which will probably come to us later, and black oats may be more of an issue uh, or less suited. I don't think it's possible. So ryegrass and radish are a common target for us. It's probably only to be ryegrass at the moment. But certainly, um, you know, I don't think these are immune to it. And there is some data which I'll show you in a second that suggests that uh, black oats or wild oats are not, um, not the impossibility that we thought that might have been with shedding. This is the work by uh, Michael Wittrick and his team out of northern New South Wales. There's just looking at a range of three crops here and some peewees in those regions there and, and how much seed is actually retained at harvest um, above that 15 centimetres. And it just, I won't spend much time on it, but you can see here a lot of these 80, 90%, 40 to 100%. 
Barney and Rush Hunt will send you a bloody cat now and you might not get much of that down here. But quite obviously there's not a lot above that harvest pipe. So it's not really a good, um, good culprit for this sort of thing. So also about where you put harvest leaf seed management. What about putting in blowouts? Unfortunately, on the self guilty for it um, is you tend not to move until you have to. Um, you see a paddock like this, this is sudden, believe it or not. Um, and um, you want to go in there and, and put it into there. It is good on high populations, but it's no silver bullet, and um, it may take some time to, um, to get into it. If you've got a situation like this and all your post emergence are gone, you know, hay or green slash brown mule might be a better option in that particular paddock. Okay? Just incidentally, um, this paddock here is just to the right of this paddock here, and that's where they live right And you can see there that they've got a good level of weed control there. But you can still see there's still quite a amount of grass outside that windrow, and that's because you can see the background pressure there, and that's a residual wheat population. One year's treatment with harvest wheat seed management or windrow burning is not going to fix it, and we're not going to go back to old school stuff, okay? It's, it's part of an ongoing program, it's going to have to be part of a bigger program. Prepare the header ahead of harvest. Fit the shoots, I don't know how many people I've talked to, oh yeah, no, I'm going to give that a go, they're all passionate about it. You talk to them after harvest and go, oh, I just ran out of time, I didn't get the shoot on there or whatever. Get into it now, get the header in the shed, fit it up, it's a pretty easy rule. Um, they don't have to be watertight or airtight, they simply just got to catch that straw fraction, open it at the bottom uh, with no catching rules. Pretty simple, plenty of stuff on the internet, um, pictures in the paper in the, in the proceedings, uh, get on the internet. Um, there's some YouTube videos on the JRDC website as well. Why do we fit the shoot the back? Why don't we just turn the spinners or the choppers off? This is some work by Walsh and Newman again out of Western Australia. It's looking at, uh, this first one is a sanding stubble, so the temperature, uh, the duration and the temperature spikes up really quick. You've got to achieve 400 degrees for 10 seconds at least for ryegrass. Didn't even reach the 400 degrees. Peaked up, gone out, no good. Where we just drop the um, the spinners off, and they're called a conventional windrow. It's eventually built. Um, temperature it's achieved at 400 degrees, but drops away fairly quickly. Where you push that entire tractor and skew residue in there, and you've got this huge fuel load, the temperature climbs to there and can then maintain for a very long time for the future, ensuring that you're getting that incineration of those weeds. Um, what about what paddocks you harvest first? Again, um, this is some work by uh, uh, Michael Walsh, Stephen Powell, uh, looking at um, seed retention in four main species here. So time across the bottom of seed retention here. You can see there there's certainly things like uh, the top line there, the decline is a lot slower, whereas black oaks is, um, is the open triangle, which is just... Glasses on, but it drops away, um, drops away fairly rapidly. But even now, the seed days after maturity, um, I'm not suggesting that, but you know, 40 percent still retain it. But if, the point is, if you've got problem weed paddocks, you harvest them first. That goes against the grain. If you thought about it before, you said no, I'm going to harvest my worst paddock last because I don't want to spread those seeds elsewhere. If you're going to be right, then I'd suggest you do them first. Because you want to get all that seed in that row that was in the road. At harvest, you've got to cut low. Um, the guys out of Western Australia, they say there's only three things to know about windrow burning is cut low, cut low, and cut low. They are right. You've got to get low to get underneath the weed seeds, but also to um, ensure that you don't burn the paddock. And you can only destroy what you collect. So it's about educating the hub, the head drivers, so you've got backpackers on there, they're too busy texting and, and organising to piss up on the weekend or anything like that. They've got to understand what you're trying to achieve. Traditionally it's all about lift a bike, take it to a straw, get it off, get it done. It's a different sort of mindset. To understand what you're doing, certainly, um, you know, you've got to look at, you know, are you capturing it all? Should you be harvesting a slightly different direction? But they've got to understand what's going on and what the country achieved. You need to monitor grain losses. Um, certainly as more people are starting to do it. Um, sometimes I'm horrified to go out and have a look at the paddocks and have a look at the amount of loss that's in that windrow. 
It is a little bit deceptive because we are putting in a concentrated area, not in spread out over the paddock. But you've got to understand we're putting a lot more trash through the header. Okay? Um, it's not that these headers can't handle it. They're designed in, in the US and, and um, through Europe and that harvesting much bigger crops than we harvest here. They can handle it. Okay? Um, but you've got to be conscious of that and you will have you may have to look at your setup with your header um, and adjust it accordingly. Certainly road or crawl walk losses for us with our lower yielding crops are, are probably not that common, but if you start shoving that much straw through there, you've got to be conscious that you might be pushing it out there, not just off the city. The other key thing is you've got to remember you're trying to squeeze all this rubbish out of very small space. If you pull up to a dead stop, it'll just block from here forward. And, um, and yeah, don't bring me. And I'll be playing out because I love it. This is my disclaimer, I've done it now. Um, you've got to remember if you want to stop, you've either got to swing out of the crop or basically pull up and go backwards and feather it back out over where you've already harvested. If you pull up dead, it will block up in two seconds flat back and block forward. In terms of our fallow management, look, I don't think there's a lot in that. Um, there's, there's probably two points to make. Is that because you've got so much trash in that mingrow, um, it can slow the emergence of our summer weeds. Okay, it's often only evident in the first flush um, because after that first rain event, the, the row actually gets compacted. You tend to get less weeds in the mingrow than not. But that first spray, you may have to rely on any mites. I might have had to delay two or three days longer than I normally would, just to ensure that maximum block like, all the stuff out of the track layer. But once then, once that's done, you're right to go. I guess the other question is about grazing windrows. Grazing windrows and um, windrow thinning are not completely compatible. Um, and um, look, it's not the end of the world. Um, but it probably works in a non-stop system without. You've got to remember there's a lot of trash, a lot of weed seed there that's still graying in here. Um, sheep that are um, well versed on foraging, they do a pretty good job of wrapping through here. And in the process, what they tend to do is spread that wind road to disturb, disturb the integrity of it, which can lessen the effectiveness of the burn or the completeness of the burn. So, um, if you've got a grazing system, you either take that disadvantage with it, or the other one that might be worth a thought is um, car cars. They're actually dumping the chaff, and, and the chaff um, dumps are actually starting to form the self feed for a lot of the stock. But um, better a consideration for big farming systems. Burning the windrow, well, it's obviously about burning the windrow, not the whole paddy. A lot of people really query how you can do this. Well, it's about cutting low and remembering that the trash is actually in the windrow. This is a picture from Narrowmine. The first lap was done conventionally with the spreaders on. Same header did this, but they took the spinners off, put the chute on, and this is the difference. You can see here between the rows, there's a lot of trash there that's been spread back over out of that harvest width versus this stuff here. There's this trash here that allows the fire to carry through there um, when things are going. So you've got a lot less trash outside the row, all the fuel is in the row. Um, so that's where the fire is going to want to stay. The other one is that you've got it half short. But in our system with our summer rainfall and our need to retain that moisture over the summer months, it's certainly, um, unlike the Western Australians, so they're probably not quite as attuned to fallow uh, management and fallow moisture retention. It certainly could be an issue to us. But look, at the end of the day, um, I don't doubt that I'll value it highly, that moisture, but at the end of the day, if I can't control my ryegrass in my crop, no amount of impact on my fallow efficiency will replace, you know, will combat that. Okay. So it's a piece of time for them to bear, for a few of them to bear. And at the end of the day, this lack of ground cover is not going to completely wipe the fallow efficiency. It's going to take a fraction off. Um, anyway, uh, at the end of this year, we should have two years worth of work looking at that. So, um, keep um, tuned. So it's, about, it's also about choosing your conditions when you want to burn. <coughs> you don't want to burn when it's too hot because it's, it's um, too supportive of fire, it's more likely you to want to get away and burn the whole paddock. If you burn when it's too cold or too suppressive to fire, you won't get a, a complete enough burn to incinerate those weed seeds or small grout. You need to get it just right, okay? Um, this is um, old school, this is just a little, I don't know what they call it, now slide rule sort of thing. But um, it's a macarthur fire index, and what it does is take into account the curing of the fuel, the ambient temperature, the 
relative humidity and your wing speed and gives you this fire day for index around here. Who looks at Elmer's weather or weather zone? They've got the fire danger index on there. This is essentially what this is. If you uh, burn under five 